it is really a pleasure to be here. And um, I will say on a personal note that um, Joyce has always been an inspiration to me personally because um, I also have a child with food allergy. And um, for many years, I actually wasn't allowed to talk about it publicly. Um, because at the Pew Research Center, um, I was never allowed to put myself into the story. Um, and so, therefore, I, I couldn't say why I was so interested in rare and chronic disease. And, um, and uh, I have an 11-year-old son who, this year, when uh, he saw me putting together all my education materials to educate his teachers about how to save his life, he said, can I come along? Um, and so he, for the first time, participated in training his teachers in how to recognize the signs of anaphylaxis and um, how to avoid a reaction. And um, I have to say, you, you really haven't heard a laugh until you have heard an 11-year-old telling his teachers about how he could die, specifically how he could die, and then telling them a joke. <laughs> and the laugh that he got was probably one of the most extraordinary laughs because there was it was a laugh of relief where you to to have him be so honest about the challenges that he faces as a kid with food allergy um, and and to show that it's really not that big a deal as long as we all follow the rules. Um, so thank you, Joyce, for, for being an inspiration to me in, in, um, in talking to my own kid and my own family um, about um, how we can participate in his health. Um, so Chief Technology Officer at HHS, that sounds like it might be a job um, where I'm in charge of healthcare.gov or I'm in charge of the email servers or I buy software. And luckily, none of those are the case. <laughs> <laughs> I, in fact, have very, very little to do with, with anything directly related to software or the websites that, that run this wonderful, large uh, federal agency. Um, the role of the chief technology officer is more like an entrepreneur in residence or more like chief innovation officer in that um, what we do in the Idea Lab is use the tools um, that each of us have learned um, related to design thinking, to lean startup methods, um, to bring that gospel to the federal government. And it was started um, under the leadership of Secretary Sebelius, and it operates with a very um, strong support of Secretary Burwell. Um, and the IDEA, the acronym for IDEA, stands for Innovation, Design, Entrepreneurship, and Action. And we are a resource all, for all the agencies that make up HHS. So just in the last week, I um, spent time at the NIH, the FDA, the CDC. Um, and um, what's really a privilege is to be within this huge bureaucracy. And yet everyone that I work with starts with yes. Everyone who comes into our office wants to create change. And what we all recognize is that the problems that we face in healthcare today um, are, are too big, are too complicated. It's, it's moving too fast to just do things the old way. And which is why um, we divide our work into three areas. And, and one reason I, I love to come and give talks is because I have a secret agenda. I'm just gonna be upfront about it. I want you and everyone you know to consider coming to do a tour of duty with the federal government, within HHS. That's one of the opportunities that we have at the IDEA Lab. Um, so I'll talk about the three buckets, but I just wanted to open by saying that's my secret agenda. I want you guys to consider it. Um, so one way that we do our work in the IDEA Lab is to leverage external talent and to bring people in for these tours of duty. We have a program called Entrepreneurs in Residence and a program called Innovators in Residence. And it's a, um, an opportunity for people to come in with a specific skill set to help um, CDC attack a certain problem. Um, because what will happen is the, um, the operating division will come to the IDEA Lab and say, we know we have this problem and we can't solve it. Which is the first step to any um, problem solving exercise, to admit that you have a problem and that you can't solve it. Um, and it's sort of like putting up a bat signal. 
and then we try and help them find Batman. And I've got some great examples of that. And um, that skill set, um, as I say, is, is sometimes has to do with technology, and sometimes it really doesn't. Sometimes it's about process change. Um, what we also do is, is um, promote internal innovation. We run an Ignite Accelerator and a Ventures Fund, um, which I'd love to talk about more, but that's really for HHS employees, so I won't, I won't um, go over it too strongly. Um, and the third thing that we do is we build collaborative communities. And that's where I feel like the experience that I have in um, studying peer-to-peer -peer healthcare and my interest in the maker movement um, really comes together with the work of HHS because they understand that you can really only create change if there's a community of practice around it. Um, the first CTO of HHS was Todd Park, and he came into the federal government and saw that we were sitting essentially on the equivalent of an oil well that was going untapped, and that is all of the health data that's available that is collected by the federal government and, and wasn't made available in a machine-readable format online. And so he helped start the health data initiative. And that's an example um, of a community of practice that, that we um, have helped create. Um, we also have a community of practice and have built a collaborative community around government acquisition, which I never thought that I would um, have any expertise in. <laughs> if anybody wants to talk about government acquisition, we can talk later. It's otherwise really, really boring. But, except for the fact, until you see the numbers, IT acquisition in the government has a fail rate sometimes, in some sectors, of up to 80 or 90 percent because of the way we acquire IT and digital services. Um, and so we're innovating around that because we know we can do better. Um, so I um, am really, frankly, more of an anthropologist than a technologist. And when I was um, being recruited to take on this role, I kept asking them, are you sure? <laughs> you, you know, you, do you really understand who I am and what I do? And um, my dad, who's an engineer especially, was really surprised. He successfully got my sister to be an engineer, my brother to be an engineer, and I went off and studied anthropology. And yet I was the one who ended up the chief technology officer for a major federal agency. <laughs> And um, they said, absolutely, because we understand that, that technology these days is about culture, that code is culture. And the choices that we're making around technology um, are really cultural choices that we're making. Um, and so that really comes from the top. That comes from the leadership at HHS. Um, and when I came in, um, in a way, I actually saw the same thing that, that Todd Park saw. Todd came in and saw health data as the opportunity that was really being missed. Um, and when I came in and took a look around, I've been on the job four months, and I saw immediately that the opportunity that's really being missed is the maker movement. Um, and it's something that people really aren't yet really aware of that, and what the potential is for healthcare in general and the federal government in particular to really understand what's going on out there. And so that's why I'm here um, to, to learn from you guys and to tell you a little bit about what I want to work on um, to recruit you, as I said at the beginning, and, um, and just to, to think about what we can create together. Um, and I'll say that um, in addition to my own experience of, as, uh, as a mom of a kid with food allergy, um, a lot of the work that I've done throughout my career um, is field work in patient communities of people living with rare disease, um, chronic disease, people living with disability. And the reason why I have spent so much time um, doing that field work is because those are the places where you find people who are pushing the edges of any field. Um, if you can find the hackers, if you can find the artists, if you can find the people who um, make a way out of no way, then you're gonna see the future. Um, and the way that I think of the work that you guys are doing is um, you're building the future. And what we need are more ambassadors from the future to come and talk to establishment healthcare. Um, and that's the role that, that I see myself playing, that um, what um, the secretary has asked me to do is be someone who in every meeting is thinking about how this, um, is going to play out five years from now. 
um, and how especially this is playing out on the front lines of healthcare, which we all acknowledge to be at home. Um, that we all really acknowledge how much of healthcare um, happens at home. And so um, what I have seen is that we really need to leverage um, what really is an American story in many ways, the sense of um, ingenuity, the, the sense that, that we can be pioneers, we can fix things ourselves. Um, and I'm also happy to say that this comes also from the White House. Um, you guys have probably heard about the White House Maker Fair and um, how President Obama is enthusiastic about this. Um, and so is the, the um, White House CTO, Megan Smith. And they talk about um, creating an innovation nation. And what I'm doing at HHS is extending that into healthcare. Um, I'm very happy to say that when I arrived, um, I started meeting people who are just as into the maker movement as all of us are. There are pockets of people all across the federal government, at um, the FDA, at the NIH, <laughs> um, at the VA, at USAID, who are also looking at what can we learn from people in the field, and what, how can we bring that back in? Um, and um, the reason why I'm especially passionate about this is that I think there are so many good ideas out there, so many problems that have been solved that are not spreading. And they're not spreading to the people who really need to have access to them. Um, and sometimes what, what I've seen in my field work and what I think everybody here knows is that it's often sometimes a very simple change. It's, it's, it's not necessarily a, um, a, a new invention that's like the, the unicorn that, that everybody's seeking in Silicon Valley. It's, it's not something that's, that's necessarily going to be the moonshot, the man on the moon kind of thing. It's the, it's the small changes that you can make, the tweak to a technology or a process that can really make all the difference. Um, or it's just something very simple. Um, and so one of my favorite stories to tell is actually a story um, set in the far past of our history. 1601, um, there was a uh, ship owner who had four ships this is in England. Um, and he had noticed, as had been true for, for all of um, human history, that when you send sailors out on a long voyage, they come back with bleeding gums and wounds that will not heal. And we now know that this is uh, scurvy. And there's a very simple fix to this. It's, it's just a lack of vitamin C that causes scurvy. Um, and so this uh, ship owner who had four ships sent three out with the standard diet and one ship out with lemon juice added to the sailor's diet. So he was essentially conducting a, a controlled clinical trial in a way. Um, and when the ships came back, they noticed that the sailors with the lemon juice were much healthier. Um, which sounds great, except it was not until 1795 that the British Navy adopted citrus as part of, as a standard part of sailors' diets. So it took 200 years um, between 1601 and 1795 for this to be adopted. And we now, the, this, this is the lethal lag time that a lot of us see in medicine and science and healthcare, that there is a discovery of something that doesn't spread. And what we have now is the possibility of the internet connecting us to each other to allow the spread of ideas. And we've seen it in so many fields. We've seen it um, in so many ways. And that's what I see happening here and all across the country. Um, and yet, it's still really down deep in the pockets of our healthcare system. So that um, I don't think it's spreading fast enough. And so a question that I have for you is how might we spread these ideas faster? Um, and what are the, the, the simple mechanisms that you're seeing um, that you can tell me about as evidence? Um, I'll tell you about a couple of my favorites just to sort of um, help you to understand what I mean. Um, there's a, a, a woman that I met whose mother weighs about 100 pounds and her father weighs about 200 pounds. And she couldn't physically, the, the mom couldn't physically turn her husband in bed. He's, he was incapacitated by a stroke. And um, she was hurting her back all the time until a friend came over and said, oh, I know what you need. You need a baker's spatula. 
which is like a pizza peel. Um, and you can edge it under the heavier person and use it as a lever. Um, well, this is revolutionary, and it's not something that's ever going to be necessarily available through Medicare, Medicaid. It's not going to get marketed. But this can really, really help someone. Um, another one that I love is um, I've spent a lot of time in a community of um, people living with Mobius syndrome. Mobius syndrome is a very rare disease. It's about two in one million, um, and it uh, exhibits uh, with um, full facial paralysis. So um, kids who are born can't suck on a bottle. Um, and so what they immediately have to do on day one is figure out how to hack a sippy cup or hack a bottle so that the baby can be fed. Um, and these kids are often born with malformed hands. And so this is one example that a lot of people who are in PT understand. You just wrap a washcloth around a pen with a rubber band, and then the kid can write. And so this is something, again, that's really, really simple. And we, we see a lot of this in our world. And yet, people don't know about it. Um, the OBQ is an example of um, a, a change in design for the, for the EpiPen which was created um, 50 years ago. The number one reason people die of anaphylaxis is they don't have their EpiPen with them. The number two reason why people die of anaphylaxis is that a bystander doesn't know how to use the EpiPen. This has been well established in study after study after study. And yet, nobody ever thought, well, why don't we redesign the thing so that it's more obvious how to use? Why don't we redesign the thing so that it actually fits in any pocket? It took two uh, boys growing up in Virginia um, who said, who basically devoted their lives to changing this. Um, and one went to pharmacy school and the other went to business school. And they created the Audi Q, which is about this big um, and fits in any pocket. And once you take it out of its case, it talks you through how to use it. Think of all the other problems in healthcare that could so clearly be changed just if we noticed the real problem. We have this miracle drug, epinephrine, which stops the anaphylaxis reaction. And yet, if it's not delivered because the EpiPen isn't there, because the EpiPen is poorly designed, that's a fail. So think of all the things that we could change if we could just pay attention to patients and pay attention to the real problems in healthcare. Um, so um, when I was looking at the description for this event, I, I loved that, that the definition of health also included finding joy in life. Um, and I thought about a friend of mine who runs a nonprofit called Hope for Henry. Um, and she brings joy into kids' lives who are in the hospital. Um, and uh, she said, you know, there, there really is something magical about just giving kids stickers, um, about um, creating a delightful experience for a kid. Um, and I wonder if you guys know about, for example, Beads of Courage. Um, so anytime a kid, it's basically a way um, for a kid to, um, as they put it, to record, tell, and own their stories of courage um, while they go through um, treatment for a serious um, illness such as cancer. And the kids get different beads depending um, if, if, you're, if you get a shot or transfusion, you get a certain color bead. If you have a, a chemotherapy, you get a certain color bead. And so there's kids who are in the hospital and have these long, long, long strings of beads. And it's a visual representation of their medical record. Um, and you think about the role that beads have played in human history, that they really can be a form of currency. They can be a, a, a symbol of power. Um, and it's this, this ancient kind of symbol that we can give to kids. And they can make this visual representation of their experience in the hospital. And so how else might we unleash that and, and use that sense of empathy for the kids' experience and use art to find joy even in the worst experience um, that they're going through or that their parents are going through? Um, so um, what I also really liked is, is that um, this, this is a group that really is wonderful at activities. Um, and so I um, asked Patricia actually to help me. Um, so I'm going to pass out paper and markers, or if you guys have pens, um, and then we're going to do an exercise, because I'm, I'm going to need your help. I'm going to ask for this back. Um, so if you guys can pass back paper. There we go.
start back here. Yeah, great. And then I have pens. If anybody needs a pen, I brought in all the sharpies from the registration. <laughs> so run forward. Feel free to run forward. Get a sharpie. Um, you have time while I explain the exercise. Um, so when I came into the federal government, what I found is that, um, frankly, people didn't really know what I was talking about. I would talk about makers, and I would get a totally blank look. And so I started making a list of all the words that, that other people might use. And so, so one of my questions for you is, when you're explaining this to your friends and family, if you're explaining this to someone who's never heard about the maker movement, what words do you use? Um, you know, so I've heard invention, I've heard innovation, I've heard ingenuity. So that's that's one of the questions. Um, and if you feel more comfortable, if you'd rather just tweet at me, then you can tweet at Susanna Fox and tell me the words that you use. Because um, it, it really would be helpful to me to understand how people, how people that you talk with understand what we're talking about. Um, and the other question that I had for you, um, and this is something that, that um, I had to create because my friends, in, my friends and colleagues in the federal government really think about the world in terms of the, the vast U.S. population, where my friends at the CDC are talking about you know, global issues, whole continents. Whereas a lot of where I've spent my field work is in communities of people living with rare disease or, or you know, caregivers who are um, uh, caring for people with dementia in, in much smaller settings. Um, and so in order to understand this, I created what a diagram of the ecosystem of um, the health maker movement. So I'm going to ask you guys to draw this on your paper. So the vertical axis, if you just draw a big cross, the vertical axis is the axis where I think about it in terms of the barriers to entry. So up here, you just put the word high. That's high barriers to entry. So a high barrier to entry would be something like, it's very expensive even to just create a prototype, um, or uh, much less you know, manufacture you know, 10,000 units. Um, or the, another high barrier to entry um, is that this is something that's going to be uh, heavily regulated by the FDA. Or you're not even sure if it's going to be regulated by the FDA. You wonder if it will be regulated by the FDA. Um, another one is, is um, it's just going to take a lot of evidence. And you can't even imagine what it would be like to get a grant from the NIH to study it. So that would be the high barriers to entry versus low barriers to entry. And the low barriers to entry are things like the baker spatula for turning a loved one in bed or wrapping a washcloth around a pen. On this axis, the, the horizontal axis, this is about audience and potential, the, the audience that it would serve. And over here would be the mainstream, like all the whole world could benefit from this or, or you know, a huge majority of the population versus really a niche audience, like sort of an N of one. Um, and this is where I think about things like um, the, the low niche, <laughs> the low barriers to entry in niche, that's where I've spent most of my field work. And I wonder how many people in this room feel that they're part of this, where they sort of have solved their own problem, which is a really typical experience for entrepreneurs. Entrepreneurs, really successful entrepreneurs, identify a problem that needs to be solved in their own life, and they go after it, and hopefully they can move from this quadrant over to this quadrant, you know, so that you can sell a lot of units, or, or really have an impact, not just about selling, but just having an impact on the world. Um, and up here, I would put the obby queue. So the obby queue is something that these two guys growing up in Virginia could invent something new, but they needed to sell it to Sanofi, a major pharmaceutical company, who could then, you know, uh, get past the FDA and talk to insurers. Um, so that, that would be this sector. And frankly, this is where my colleagues in the government, when I start talking about making and I'm talking about this, their eyes are glazed over until I start to talk about this sector. And they, and they literally physically lean forward in their chairs and say like, oh, we can talk about that. That makes sense to me. Um, and what I want to do is bring in this conversation. So this is where I would say um, we're looking at um, you know, a, a, a small population with a highly regulated um, situation. And there we might think of like um, implantables, you know, prosthetics that connect to um, nerves, um, et cetera. And, and I was presenting this um, 
and somebody said, you need a different axis, you always need like a 3D axis for impact on an individual's life. And I think some of the stuff that we've seen here today, it, it might solve the problem for just a small group of people, but it would be life changing. It would be life changing to be able, for example, to, to have a hand, a child who, um, the, the Enable Project is something that I think of as something that you know, solves the problem for that kid, but wow, does it solve the problem. Um, and so what I need your help with is, is more examples to fill in my ecosystem <coughs> so that I can then um, take this back to DC and talk to my colleagues with even more examples and even more knowledge from the field. Um, and so if you, if you want to take it home and work on it and then um, take a picture of it and, and send it to me or tweet it at me or, or give it to me later, <coughs> that would be wonderful, or, or give it to Joyce and, and she'll send them to me. Um, but this is what I really need from you guys, is to better understand the ecosystem so that I can tell our story better to my colleagues in government. Um, so a couple of ideas that I had is um, asking the question, how might we lower the barriers to entry? Um, one thing that I've heard is that people who are wondering whether their device is going to be regulated by the FDA. You know, so, so how many of us actually understand the difference between a class one, class two, or class three device, right? You do. <laughs> and so, you know, we all that we open more doors and windows in the federal government. Um, one of the projects I'm really happy to say that, that we just launched is um, the Office of Civil Rights oversees um, HIPAA regulations. Um, and there's a lot of confusion around HIPAA regulations in apps. And so what, what we in the Idea Lab asked the Office of Civil Rights to do, and they did a beautiful job, and I'll tweet out a link to it, they created a portal so that app developers can ask questions of the experts at HHS about HIPAA. And then those questions are posted publicly. So I'm not saying this is going to happen, but a question that I have is, how might the FDA make it easier for people to understand whether something's, whether an invention or a tweak is going to be regulated or not? These are the kinds of questions that I want you guys to ask me so that I can bring them to my colleagues. Um, another um, idea that I had is um, how can we make manufacturing tools more available? And this is sort of like, when I think about the Health Data Initiative, I think about how cloud computing was like accelerant poured on the fire. You know, the only reason we're able to really handle big data is because of cloud computing. And that's what I'm looking down the road and seeing the ever cheaper um, cost for manufacturing, um, that, that this is going to be the accelerant that's poured on our fire. What other accelerants do you see? What are the other mechanisms that are going to create change in our field? That's really what I want to learn from you guys, what you guys are seeing in, in the field. Um, and how might we make it easier for people to find what's already been invented? Um, and I'll just close by, by saying that um, one of my mentors in the federal government, Tom Khalil, who works in the White House, <coughs> talks about how Nordstrom now has a relationship with Etsy in that um, uh, the buyers from Nordstrom are always looking for what's going to be the next cool thing. You know, where is the designer of like the headband that's going to be super popular? Um, or the t-shirt design that, that's going to go viral. Um, and Etsy is kind of like an early warning system for Nordstrom. And what they value is that they are able to hear from Etsy about what is going viral, what's, what's popular. And then Nordstrom can go to that craft maker, that, that small business, and say, how can we help you go from 100 to 100,000 units? Um, how can we, you know, scale up? And, and so my question for you is, who is the Nordstrom in healthcare? And who is the Etsy? And to place this in context, a lot of people talk about this in terms of economic stimulus. And I'm definitely interested in that. I think a lot of what we do opens the doors for small businesses, and that's great. But I think what we're all here to talk about is real change in people's lives. And we really want to have an impact on people's lives. And you know, if people are going to make money, fine. 
But a lot of this isn't about making money. A lot of this is about saving lives. Um, and so that's really what I appreciate about, about what I've seen here today and, and what I want to hear from you more. Um, so please um, tweet at me and um, I'll freely hand out my email. It's just my name, Susanna.fox at hhs.gov. Um, and uh, it's, it's just such a privilege to be here. Thank you so much for having me.